Hello, hello, and welcome to our COP online evening service. We get to be together for the next few minutes, worshiping, reading the Word of God, studying His Word, and we're going to have a great time. We always start with Psalm 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you, no plague come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder. The young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Amen. Well, for our praise moment tonight, we are going back to Psalm 147. That is our third psalm in the Hallelujah Chorus of the Book of Psalms. And tonight, as we learn how to praise the Lord, we're going to read verses 2 through 4. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars. He gives to all of them their names. What we have here in these few verses in the book of in Psalm 147 is very, very typical, not only of the Psalms, but anywhere in the Bible where it states or it, it lists or it, it records a praise that happened by the people of God. If the people were worshiping or if there's a song that's meant for worship, we very typically have a listing of he. He does this. He does that. He does the other thing. It's very typical. And that makes me wonder, is it typical in our praise? Do we spend all of our praise saying, Lord, thank you. You're so good. You're so awesome. You're so, or do we recount and recall to the Lord the he did this, he did that. Lord, you rescued me that time when I was about to get held up or you you were with me as I walked through a dark street going home. Whatever it is, you provided for my child's tuition for school. You gave us what we needed to get that new computer because we had so many needs for online education and whatever. It's very typical a listing of what the Lord does. And we need it to be typical in our praise as well. We know that our scope of praise comes from Psalm 150, verse 2, who he is and what he does. We praise him for his excellent greatness and for his mighty works, his mighty deeds. Both of those are necessary if your praise is going to be complete. <laughs> Some people say we praise him for what he does. We worship him for who he is. We have to understand praise is one piece of the worship pie. Praise, in order to be complete, needs to be who he is, 
and what he does. So what are the benefits of recalling the works or the deeds of the Lord? There are two really basic benefits that I can think of, you know, first of all, just to get started. Number one, it builds our faith. When we start recalling, Lord, this is what you did for Gideon. This is what you did for Moses. This is what you did for Abraham. Lord, look how you enabled David to slay that giant, that Goliath that came against the people of God. And David slew him. And then you start reciting what God has done in your life. It builds our faith. Why is our faith built by stories? No, the faith is built by hearing and hearing the word of God right? So when we hear our own mouth reciting the deeds that God has done for Samuel and Daniel and Ezekiel and Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, Peter, everybody, it builds our faith. And secondly, what is the benefit of recalling the deeds of the Lord? In our praise, if we are reciting the deeds of the Lord, it lets the new believers know who their father is, what their what the character of their father is all about. It's like family stories that lets you learn and understand where you belong and what you can expect belonging to this family. Now, at COP, a lot of people have heard me tell the grandma story, but this is appropriate here. If you were a kid, and your mom said to you, okay, it's Sunday for lunch. We're going to grandma's. And you went, yay, we're going to grandma's. And you went to your grandma's house. You went to your mom's mom. And as soon as she opened the door to let you in, she said, oh, I love you. You might feel pretty good. Like, hey, my grandma loves me. That's awesome. But then as you go inside, and the family is gathering. She just looks at you and gets your cheeks and says, I love you. I love you so much. And you go, okay, I think that's established. She loves me. And as dinner is served, she just looks at you and goes, I love you. I love you. Pretty soon you're going to be going, okay, this is creepy grandma. <laughs> I know she loves me, but she's not saying anything else. And I don't know how to respond anymore. And all the way through the whole afternoon, she just keeps saying, I love you. And then when you're ready to go home and get out of there, she opens the door as you're leaving and waves bye-bye and says, I love you. I love you. Okay, next Sunday, fast forward, your mom says to you, okay, for lunch, we're going to grandma's house. You go, oh, again, your dad's mom. We're going to your dad's mom this week. So you go to your dad's mom. And when she opens the door to let you in, she says, I love you. And you go, oh, not again. But as you come in, she says, I know it's going to be lunchtime in just a little while, but would you like a cookie first? I'll give you a cookie and your favorite drink, your favorite juice. Sit down. I've got some stories to tell you. And as you sit there, she starts telling you, do you know what happened when you were just a baby? One day, your mom had gone to choir practice and your dad was left to take care of you. And you know what? He turned his back for just a minute and there you were laying on the floor. When he turned his back, when he came back to you, he couldn't find you. You were gone. Well, it turned out you had rolled over and rolled right underneath the sofa, the couch. But your dad didn't know that. And he was thinking, what am I going to do? I got to tell your mom that I lost our baby until the dog found you. <laughs> and then your dad went, oh, thank goodness. And all through the afternoon, your grandma is telling you stories about what your dad did, what your father is like. And do you know his favorite is ice cream? Mm. <laughs> and especially this flavor or, you know, and when he, by the time you go out of there that day, what has happened to you? 
you have come to an understanding of what your family is like. Maybe you understand, oh, no wonder I fit into this family so well. <laughs> no wonder I am really my dad's kid. <laughs> I'm just like him. I like that too. And so it is with our praises. When we praise God and we proclaim the deeds of the Lord, people are going to say, oh, that's what my father is like. Oh, that is why he does what he does, because he's like this. And this is what my father has done. And we learn that if God did it before, he'll do it again. If he did it for someone else, he'll do it for me. And new believers are encouraged to grow in their faith because they understand the character. They understand God, who he is, and what he does. So this is two very good reasons why we recall his deeds while we praise. Well, in Psalm 147, verse 2 to 4, what are some of those deeds? It starts off with, he builds up. Actually, I love these. He builds. He gathers. He heals. He's doing awesome things. He does positive things in our life. He builds up Jerusalem. Okay, he builds up your life. He builds you up. The word means to build, to make, to rebuild or restore. So one of the reasons why we halal, why we hallelujah, make our praise demonstrative and passionate is that the Lord rebuilds us. He restores us. We're celebrating the year of restoration. This is what God does. But I want you to know that the same word is used in Genesis 2 verse 22 when the Lord took a rib from Adam and he made a woman. Okay, so we learn that this word build is a creative word. God can make something in your life. He can make something out of the most, a rib, <laughs> the most basic building materials. Don't you remember how he fed 5,000 out of the one boy's lunch? One lunch multiplied to feed 5,000. God can make something in your life. Even if you feel like you don't have much to offer him in terms of building materials. Hey, don't put yourself down. He made you. <laughs> he can make something great out of you. And you might feel that you've lost almost everything in the economic troubles coming from the pandemic. But if God can take a rib and make a lifetime companion... He can take a single lunch and feed 5,000. He can certainly take what you have and rebuild and remake and make those dreams that you have in your life come to pass. So it means that God is going to take any discouragement from your life and rebuild and build and restore. And you're going to have your greatest worship this year that you have ever had as God in our year of restoration, restores worship to you. Amen. Amen. Now, let's go and worship the Lord together.
As we turn our attention tonight to the book of Romans, chapter 12, we have to understand that everything in Romans now changes. In Romans chapter 1, verse 8, we taught in detail the beautiful doctrines of condemnation, justification, sanctification, glorification, righteousness, who we are in Christ, what, what Christ has done for us on the cross. In chapters 9, 10, and 11, we answered the question, did God's word fail? The, the big question of the Gentile church that day, why didn't the gospel work among the Jews? What happened to the Abrahamic and Davidic covenants? We learned the doctrine of salvation from all different angles and perspectives. And we've come to understand the great principles of the mercy of God. We closed out with that. How mercy operates in our lives before salvation, how mercy brings us to salvation, and how mercy operates in our lives after salvation. But now as we begin chapter 12, we now move from theology to practical application. In light of everything that God has done for us, how does this mean that we should live? Let's start with Romans chapter 12, beginning with verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, so in view of all this mercy that I've just taught you about, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. It's good, pleasing, and perfect will. Now, Paul starts here with the word, therefore. It's a word of connection. He says, all right, let's go back to the mercy of God that we've taught all the way since Romans chapter 1. Let, let's remember everything about the mercy of God, and let's connect the mercy of God with all of the balance of this teaching through the practical truths. So all I want to look at tonight is one simple verse, because I don't want to lose the significance of verse 1 by getting it tied up in verse 2, and both verses are powerful, so we'll deal with them one by one. All I want to talk with you tonight is the call of dedication and the offering that we make of our lives in dedication. Now, there is a true call to dedication. There are many false calls to dedication. And these false calls for dedication come from a place of bondage and from a place of control. Sometimes it's very sweet control, but it's, it's still control. It usually comes from zealous young Christians trying to command other zealous young Christians and they fall into it. You see, zeal always yells and shouts at you, get more committed, get more committed, and get more committed. But they don't ever tell you how. You know, zeal is good at complaining about everybody else, but it has no answers for anybody else. So let's start with the idea of who makes the call to dedication. Look at verse 1. Therefore, I urge you. I, Paul. Paul was not a, a young baby Christian who was extremely zealous, but had no knowledge, calling us to dedication. Paul was the seasoned apostle that bore in his body the marks of Christ, that had suffered, that had lived a life of persecution, that had lived a life of dedication in the face of that persecution. And here this seasoned old apostle who has paid the price for a lifetime yet kept his heart right. He is the one who challenges us for dedication. Now to be blunt, anyone else who makes a call to commitment and dedication doesn't have the moral authority to do so. Some young man or some young woman who are very zealous for God, they, they don't have the moral authority to call people to a life of dedication. They haven't lived it themselves. You see, in order to call somebody to this life of dedication, to, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, it has to be somebody who has done that, who has lived that faithfulness, who has lived that commitment for a lifetime. And you say, oh, pastor, you're just teaching that because you're old now. Number one, I'm not old. I'm still young. I'm only 64. But number two, I've taught this the same way since the first time I taught you Romans way back in the early 80s. The very first time I began to teach you this passage was way back in the early 80s, and I taught it the same then. When the people who are qualified 
to challenge us to a life of total commitment are not some zealous young puppy who who is in his arrogance and pride thinks he's better than everybody else. This has to come from someone who has lived the life and has paid the price and bears in their body the marks and the scars of paying that price for a lifetime. Now notice with this seasoned old apostle how he presents the call for dedication. He says, I urge you, brothers, the Greek word for urge here is parkleo. It sounds like parakletes, diba? Same, same root, parakleo. It means to come alongside, to come alongside and help. So he, he's, the picture that you see here is this seasoned apostle who bears in his body the marks, who, who has suffered and lived faithfully for a lifetime. He comes outside these young Christians and this is the picture, the word picture that he paints. He comes alongside and puts his arm around him and begins to talk. And that's how he makes the call to commitment. It's not, it's not shouted at somebody. It's not screamed at somebody. It's, a, it's not like a hellfire and brimstone, nor is it an emotional, be zealous, be zealous, be committed, be committed. It's not an emotional worked up thing. It's the Apostle Paul as a wise old man who has paid the price, and Kaya, he has the moral authority. Coming alongside, putting his arm around them, and saying, let's talk about something for a minute. I want to talk to you about your commitment. I want to talk to you about your dedication. And you know what? When that wise old Paul puts his arm around you, and you know how he has lived the life for a lifetime, you look up and you go, yeah, I'll listen to this guy. I'll listen to this guy. Now, his motivation, and this is the big one. He says, therefore, I, this wise old apostle who's lived the life, okay, I have the moral authority, urge you, come alongside gently, put my arm around you to have a conversation. No, no shouting, no yelling, no emotional workup. And he said, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy. Now, notice, there's no put down there, brothers. He identifies. He said, listen. I'm not putting you down. I'm not criticizing you. I'm not acting like I'm spiritually superior to you. You know, so, sometimes these, these young guys who, who get all arrogant and spiritually superior and they're all holy and everybody else is not holy and only people who, the only people that, that stay in the churches are the unholy because you're the holy one that they're following. You just, you just look at people. He said, no, no, brothers. He said, we're equal. There's no superiority here. And he says, I'm asking for this commitment in view of God's mercy. Now, how different from religion? See, religion asks us to sacrifice in order to receive mercy. God says sacrifice and dedication is a fitting response to already having received mercy. Now, notice the difference there. Religion comes and says, you sacrifice in order to receive mercy. God comes along and says, sacrifice and dedication is the right fitting response to already having received mercy. It's something that's already flown to your life. So therefore, you, you don't get motivated to commitment and dedication by the fear of judgment. I'm sorry, that, that's not what gets people committed. You don't, you don't get motivated to commitment and dedication by even a desire for blessings. Do you, do you remember the people of Israel? God said, let's go worship. Let's go worship. Let's go worship. And the people of Israel, you know, stay there in Egypt and go, you know, we would rather stay here for the blessings in Egypt. We're going to go to the promised land. Now, that's the promise of blessings. They said, no, no, you know, you know, they started complaining. They want to go back to Egypt where they had their fill of meat and they ate the garlics and the leeks. They weren't motivated by a desire for blessing. They weren't even motivated by worship. See, commitment and dedication has to be motivated by a revelation of mercy in your life, that you have received mercy. Now, you just need to pause and think about this for a little while, because if you're going to try to think that you're going to be motivated because 
you know, somebody said, all right, if you do this, you'll be, you'll get blessed. Yeah. If you don't do this, God's going to judge you. You know, I remember when I was very young, the rapture was used as a big motivation to get people to get saved. And the rapture was used as a big motivation to get people to live more committed. And I can remember one day after grandpa taught me that, you know, you don't have to change your lifestyle for the rapture. It's part of your salvation. I wasn't afraid of the rapture anymore. And so all these calls to commitment and dedication didn't motivate me. You know, they could stand up and say all that they wanted about the rapture. And the rapture is coming soon. You got to live like this. You got to do this. You got to do this. Didn't motivate me anymore. See, the true thing that motivates us in view of the mercies of God, all that mercy that we've talked about from Romans 1 all the way through Romans 11, all that mercy, all the mercy that you have received in life, that is what should motivate you to be dedicated. All the mercy that you have received in life, that's what should motivate you. That should be the driving thing that motivates you to be dedicated and committed. So he says, all right, therefore I urge you, brothers. Okay, therefore, ties us back to all the mercy before. I urge you, I'm coming alongside as a wise old father, Paul would say, and, and putting my arm around you and just having a talk with you. Brothers, Paul said, I'm just identifying with you. There's no superiority here. There's no holier-than-thou attitude here. In view of God's mercy, keeping in mind the mercy of God. He said, now, that should be your motivation. He said, now, what I want to ask you to do is to give yourself as a living sacrifice. Now, this is a post-salvation decision. Let me say that again. This is a post-salvation decision. He said, in view of God's mercy, he said, I want you to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. He said, now, Jesus, both as high priest and sacrifice, as sacrifice, Jesus laid down his life for us. And he said, now, Jesus is asking the same thing of you. He laid down his life for you. Now he's asking you to lay down your life for him. To offer your body as a living sacrifice. Now, the Greek word here for offer means to place beside, to put near, to place at one's disposal or to yield. It, it has the idea of a a once and for all presentation. So Paul is saying, as an act of your will, following your salvation, as an act of your will, post-salvation decision, he said, I, I want to urge you. I, I want to come alongside and talk to you. In light of all of the mercy that you have received, could you just place yourself once and for all at the disposal of God? Could just once and for all, could you just lay yourself there and say, God, I'm yours. Whatever you want with my life, God, I'm yours. Whatever you want to do with my life, God, I'm yours. Whatever you want for my future, God, I'm yours. Whatever your will is, God, I'm yours. Now, now this is all Paul is asking. He said, brothers, he said, my brothers, I'm coming alongside, putting my arm around you to talk to you. In view of all the mercy that God has shown to you in your life, you've already been a recipient of mercy. You're already an object of his mercy. Now, in, in light of all of that, he said, can you just come and one time and forever offer yourself to God and say, God, Whatever you want to do with my life, I'm available. They say, well, pastor, what happens if I don't like his will? <laughs> he will create both the desire and the ability to do his will. I remember as a baby Christian, as soon as I got saved, everybody started telling me I was going to be a preacher. And I remember getting so upset about it. I am not going to be a preacher. I am not going to be a preacher. I'm going to be an accountant. I'm going to work in finance departments. I'm going to be a CFO. I'm going to do this. I'm going to... Because that's how I had planned my life. Now, I was happy to be saved, but this was my life plan. I was going to become a millionaire and retire by the age of 30. And this is this. I had my life all planned out. And then one day I began to realize 
all that he had done for me. And I came one morning in my devotions. I lived in a dormitory, so actually I read my Bible in the dorm room, and then to pray, I would go for a walk because it was the only place to be alone on the university campus. I'd walk early in the morning. And I remember praying, God, whatever you want with my life, I'm here. You, you've been good to me. When I, when I realized what I could have been, when I realized what could have been, you, you've been good to me. And you know, yes, then God did call me to the ministry, but God could have called me to be a doctor or anything else. At that point, I didn't care. I just wanted his will in my life. Now, it's, it's a once and for all presentation. You don't have to do this every single day of your life. You, you give yourself once and for all. Now, what is it that you give? He said, offer your bodies, okay? Your body it means the members, all your facilities, your entire being, your life. So he said, all right, as an act of your free will, you place all of your being, all of your faculties, your abilities, all of who you are, and you place it at God's disposal forevermore. Now, now that's not a difficult thing to do when you remember the mercies of God. Now, the character of this sacrifice, first of all, it's a living sacrifice. Verse 1, to offer your body, your total faculties, all that you are, as a living sacrifice. Now, straight up, it's, it's easier to die for Jesus than to live for Jesus. Okay, to die for Jesus is a one-time decision. But to live as a living sacrifice, always available to do whatever he wants you to do, always available to be whatever he wants you to be, that is a constant 24-hour life. You know, I, I hear many young preachers today, and they don't last long in the ministry because they want their life. They want to go have fun. They want to hang out in the mall and watch movies. They, they want their life. They want to play video games. And one young pastor looked at me and said, Pastor Summer, you really don't have a life. I said, I have the most wonderful life anybody could ever ask for. He said, how can you say that? You don't do anything. You don't go anywhere. All you do is church. I said, that's the life he's chosen for me. And I'm so happy to be it. I said, now, if God had chosen for me to be a life, have the life of a world traveler, I would have been happy being that. If God would have chosen a life for me to be a businessman, I would have enjoyed that. But God chose a life of a pastor for me. And this, this is what I love. It's not something I stress about every single day of my life. It's, there's no stress about it. There's no, well, I don't want to do this. I remember we had one preacher many years ago who came to preach in our services and they talked about how they hated being pastored and they were so happy when they resigned their church and they began their traveling ministry and members walked up to me after the service and said pastor do you feel like that i said no not at all you see when you made this decision in light of the mercies of god not because of condemnation, not because of fear, not because of desired blessings, but because of the mercy of God. You're so happy just living this life, just living available. And, and remember, this sacrifice, you know, it's you put yourself there and made yourself available. Your total faculties, your intelligence, your abilities, your physical strength, you lay all those faculties at the Lord, and then you just say, I'm going to live here, Lord. Secondly, it's a holy sacrifice. I urge you, therefore, brothers, in view of God's mercy, I told you we're just going to work on this one verse tonight, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. All right, so this is a living sacrifice, and it's a holy, the Greek word hagios. It literally means set apart for God. But we're not talking about here so much as experiential holiness. We're talking about you've been set apart. The day that you come and say, God, all that I am is yours. Whatever I am, it's yours. And you choose to live as a living sacrifice. On that day, God sets you apart. You become a holy sacrifice. 
Now, that set apart means set apart from sin for a purpose of God. Now, that purpose might be to be a doctor. You know, you just think about how many young young doctors and doc daughters right now are saving so many lives in the middle of this COVID-19 thing. And, and they were called to be a doctor just as much as I was called to be a pastor. So when, when you're, you've been set apart, and there are people that have been called to be a businessman. There are people that have been called to be a professional. They're, they're called to be a lawyer. God doesn't, God doesn't treat everybody the same, but he said, when you've come to me and you've given all of yourself to me and you choose to live there, God said, I change things. I set you apart for a purpose of God. He said, you've given yourself to me. All right, now I will use you for that. Now, let me illustrate to you this way. Uh, a friend walked up and they gave me this beautiful coffee cup. And it was my favorite colors, a dark blue coffee cup. Well, not even dark blue. It's kind of a, a media, I don't know what you call the blue, but it's a beautiful, kind of like my barong, all right? Nice blue. And I looked at that and they said, Pastor, I want you to have this. I said, well, thank you. But what they didn't know is I took that and that's my favorite cup at the house. It sits out and whenever I want a nice cup of coffee that I don't want to stay hot too long, that is the cup I use. It sits on the counter every day. It's a cup that has been set apart for a purpose. When you give all of your faculties to God and you choose to live there, God sets you apart for his purposes. So you're not only going to just do the will of God. There are things that God will have you do that are his purposes. So all right, living sacrifice holy sacrifice, and then notice he continues in verse 1, and pleasing to God. The Greek word there for pleasing means very acceptable, well-pleasing, well-approved. He said, your decision to give your total faculties to God as a living sacrifice, that brings God great pleasure. It's a tremendous act of trust that you've come to him, you're saved, you know exactly what you're doing, and you look at all the mercy that he has shown to you. And you come to him and say, God, I want to be all in on this. God, you've been so good to me. You've shown so much mercy to me. So I'm going to give my total faculties to you. And God says, wonderful. I'm going to set you apart for, a, for my purposes. And then God says, wonderful. He said, that gives me great pleasure. See, it's it's... It's like a big act of trust. It's a total demonstration of trust. God, I trust you with my future. I trust you with my life. And that pleases God. Now he continues then. This is your spiritual act of worship. This is your spiritual act of worship. Now the Greek word there for spiritual, logikos, literally means rational or logical. Worship here, latrinately means divine service of worship. It's a kind of a religious technical word. So what Paul says is this is a logical expression of worship. You responding to the mercy of God and choosing to surrender your total faculties to God as a living sacrifice that God then sets apart for his purposes and that brings great pleasure to him. He says this is a logical expression of worship. He did not say this is an emotional expression of worship. He said this is a logical response. This is not an emotional response. Now, come back to what we said at the beginning. This wise old man sits down, puts his arms around you, and says, let's talk about something for a minute. I want to talk to you about totally surrendering your life to God just in view of his mercy upon your life, giving your total faculties to God. He's not looking for an emotional response. This is not attending a youth service where somebody whips you up emotionally and tries to get you more committed. This is, this is a logical response. Okay, this is, this is logical worship. This is in view of his mercies. This is logical. 
in view of who he is and all that he has done for my life. And the fact that in doing this, he will set me apart for his purposes and it brings pleasure to him. You know what? This is a very logical act of worship. Now, when I was a young man, I couldn't preach it like this because I was still young. But now that I'm a little older, let me sit down with you right now. Don't hold your heart back from the Father. Look at all the mercy that God has shown your life. Don't hold yourself back from him. It's time to go all in with God. And this is a logical act of worship. It's time to go all in with God. Now, I don't know what his will is for your life. We'll talk more about that over the the next few nights. I, I don't know what his will is for your life, but I know it will be good. I know it will be wonderful that he will use you for his purposes. Yes, you still might be a doctor, you might be a lawyer, you might be a businessman. I I don't know. You might be a a jeepney driver. But it'll be a jeepney driver doing his purposes. Oh. So I want to talk to you tonight. Would you just sit down and think about this? And I'm not going to ask you to pray with me tonight while while we're doing this. Because this this needs to come from you. you. You need to sit down and decide, you know what? I'm happy that I'm born again, and I'm so glad I'm born again. But now it's time for me to make a post-salvation decision. And it's time for me to give the totalness of my faculties to God. I don't want to just attend church, and I'm really glad I'm going to heaven. But when I look at all the mercies of God, I want to give my total faculties to God. I want you to think about that tonight. And maybe before you go to bed, you and God have a conversation. And if you mean it, and if you're sincere, you you come to the Father and say, Father, you've been really good to me. I, I don't even know how to express my thanksgiving for all that you've done for me, for all the mercy that you've shown to my life. So, Father, I'm here right now. And, Father, I'm telling you that because of all that you've done for me, as I think about all your mercy, I am here right now. I want to go all in. My total faculties, I give to you. Whatever you want to do in, with, and through my life, here I am. I'm available. I'm here as a living sacrifice. And then you talk to God about that. And then you watch over the next few days that you really live that commitment that you're, you're really serious with God about being all in. And you watch what God begins to do in, with, and through your life. Father, make your presence very real to them. As they reach out, not in emotions, but as a logical act of expression of worship, meet them, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow morning for morning devotions, 545 Daniel's Prayer, and then morning devotions at 6. We'll see you then. Thank you for going online for tonight's evening service. We hope that you will join Pastors David and Beverly Somerville of the Cathedral of Praise Manila again tomorrow at 7 p.m. You may also join our daily devotions with Pastor David E. Somerville every Monday to Saturday at 6 a.m. You are also invited to attend any of the following services at any of the Cathedral of Praise campuses. Every Friday, 6.30 p.m., Saturday, 6 p.m., Sunday, 7.30 a.m., 10 a.m., 12.30 p.m., and 3 p.m. Our drive-in service is available for booking and happens every Saturday at 7.30 a.m. at our COP Main and South Campus parking lots. Fortress 91 is from Tuesday to Sunday from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. For more information and updates, visit us on facebook.com slash cop.manila.